At that time, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. Words taken from today's Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Over the last few weeks on the calendar, Holy Church has recounted and renewed a number of very sacred mysteries. At Christmas, God made his appearance as man, as a divine infant. And with the Epiphany season, that same man manifested himself as the one true God. The good Lord first unveiled his divinity by giving the gift of faith to the three Gentile kings who, the Bible tells us, fell prostrate before him in adoration, adoring God. Secondly, the Son of God and Son of Mary had that epiphany, that appearance at his holy baptism, where both the Holy Ghost in the form of a dove and the Father's voice testified to the divine sonship of Christ. And finally today, yet another manifestation of the divinity of Christ, especially to his holy apostles who witnessed the miracle of water being immediately changed into the most perfect aged wine that has ever been tasted by man. The belief of Peter, James, and John, and some of the other apostles was confirmed by this supernatural act. They began to believe in him. But I would like to ask a question regarding this wedding at Cana that we read about today. And that question is simple. Whose wedding was it? Who was getting married? Although the inerrant scriptures do not record the identity of the couple, holy tradition tells us the identity, at least, of the groom, namely St. Simon the Zealot, one of the apostles and, of course, a martyr. Simon the Zealot is sometimes called in the scriptures Simon the Canaanite, and he was one of the twelve apostles chosen personally by our dearest Lord. At that time, there was a political party in Israel that was referred to as the Zealots, and it seems that Simon had been associated with them. The zealots were just men, no doubt, and they were zealous. They were filled with zeal, and they were unwilling to compromise when it came to the faith and to the law of Moses. The zealots took their name from that zeal shown by the famous Maccabean warriors over a hundred years earlier, who repelled foreign invaders and also rejected alien pagan practices. St. Simon the Zealot was born in Cana of Galilee, just like that other apostle, namely Nathaniel. And as mentioned previously, tradition holds, many of the church fathers tell us, that Simon the Zealot was literally the bridegroom that was present getting married at the wedding feast of Cana. Now, as we know from the gospel passage, the wedding feast was a time of celebration, and it was about to become a bust, a disaster. The wine that helped bring life to the party had run dry. The party would be over. The bride and groom, the parents and in-laws would be ashamed. They couldn't provide. And who notices it first? A woman does, our lady. And she goes to the only individual who can actually do something about it immediately. She goes to her divine son, to the one who created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them in just six regular days. She goes to him who made all the vineyards. And our lady simply makes an observation, nothing more. They have no wine. And from this little hint, this little act of intercession, six stone water jars, according to our Lord's command, would be filled with water. He would respond to Our Lady's request. And as the late, great Archbishop Fulton Sheen once observed, that water will then be brought before its creator and will blush and become wine. Now, Simon the Zealot was certainly aware of what supplies of wine were on hand, and he knew that there was very little wine left. So therefore, the sudden discovery of what would have been 120 or perhaps 180 gallons 
of the best wine imaginable for the guests would have come upon him like a stroke of lightning. This miraculous event dwarfed even the most visionary of the political concepts Simon and his fellow zealots and patriots had discussed. They wanted to free Israel. Maybe this was the individual to do it. Simon felt less drawn towards rebellion and political intrigue and was now drawn fully focused on Jesus of Nazareth, who was the miracle worker and possibly would be the actual Messiah that had been promised to Abraham and to all the patriarchs. According to tradition, Simon was so impressed, so impressed with Christ's miracle that he and his bride later agreed to live as brother and sister all for the cause of the gospel. Beyond that, tradition suggests that after Pentecost, Simon traveled extensively to spread the message of Christ. And while in Mesopotamia, Simon, as we well know, met up with St. Jude Thaddeus. The two apostles, Simon and Jude, then traveled to Persia and preached the gospel. And their words and actions were so convincing that countless Persians converted to the one true faith. The two were eventually martyred there was St. Simon the Zealot being sawed into pieces while St. Jude was clubbed to death. Again, St. Simon the Zealot was obviously illuminated by Christ, enlightened. Our Lord is like the sun above in the skies that shines upon the moon of the church, which reflects the perfect light and illuminates those who dwell in darkness. Christ, who is the light of the world, gives us the truth. He literally is the truth in person. He provides for us true enlightenment, including the truth about marriage. Our Lord came to a wedding feast of Cana in order to bless the institution that he created to restore marriage to what it was in the beginning. Oftentimes, our Lord will often say to people, in the beginning, it was this way. We truly need this enlightenment today, considering what marriage has become. A joke. The sad state of that divine institution created by the Most High. And so we must ask ourselves, what is marriage according to nature and the God who created it? The church is clear. Marriage is a natural. It's a natural thing of this world. It will not be in heaven. No marriage between husband and wife in heaven. Marriage is a natural, indissoluble union. Perfected, completed by a sacrament between one man and one woman. Directed towards the purpose of preserving the human race by generating and raising children. Clear as day. Marriage is also ordered for the mutual help of spouses and is, not, it is, is often is not remembered also as a remedy, a cure for lust. The purpose of marriage is twofold and we must get the order correct. The primary purpose for marriage is procreation, bringing children into this world and raising them, especially in the one true faith. The secondary purpose is for the mutual help of the husband and wife, and again, a remedy for concupiscence. The term matrimony, only if we just looked at words and defined things properly. We live lies so often today. The term matrimony is a word that comes from the Latin word mater, which means mother. This is because the first end of marriage is to make a maid or a virgin into a mother who generates life. The properties of marriage are four in number, namely complementarity, indissoluble union, fidelity, and fertility. The property of complementarity simply states that only a man can complete a woman. And only a woman can truly complete and perfect a man, whether it be physically or emotionally or many other ways. God created a single couple, Adam and Eve, 
male and female, he created them. And conferred to marriage its principal characteristics, that marriage is one. One man marries one woman, and it is meant to be perpetual, that is, for the whole life of the couple. Therefore, according to natural law, this is the law of nature, which we can perceive whether we're baptized or not. According to the laws of nature, marriage is one and indissoluble. Obviously, marriage is also an exclusive union that demands faithfulness to one's spouse and rejects any infidelity or, remember, rejects any dangerous company keeping with a person of the opposite gender who is not your spouse. Careful with company keeping. Lastly, marriage is about children. It's about family. Making fertility seen as a great gift as opposed to a burden or something that has to be avoided. Give me a dog instead of children. As we all know, with the fall of Adam, the general fall of the entire human race, marriage was seriously wounded in the process. When man fell, all those institutions which God created began to be twisted by man. Polygamy, polyandry, divorce, other things were the causes of an extreme relaxation and nuptial bond. So to correct this gentle decadence into which marriage had fallen, our Lord reaffirmed the unity and indissolubility of marriage and raised it. This is what he does. He makes it better than it was in the beginning. He raised it to the level of a sacrament. For baptized couples, the sacrament of matrimony confers a grace to the natural state that marriage is. The sacrament improves natural love by giving spouses a supernatural model for their union. They should literally love each other as Christ and the church love one another. It confirms the indissolubility of the conjugal union by adding the gravity to any infidelity committed against it. There is more than just some natural promise or natural obligation involved in this indissolubility. There is something further. It's Christ's love for the church. It's the church's love for Christ. There is more than that. With the sacrament, any violation of the conjugal fidelity becomes a sin that cuts the guilty spouse from the state of grace and threatens him with the loss of eternal life. There's supernatural consequences involved with marriage now. That's a sacrament. It also adds a new perspective to the life of the couple and the family. In the natural marriage, it was supposed that the spouses should help each other and bear one another in this life and educate together their offspring who were meant to populate just this earth. But in the sacramental marriage, with faith and baptism, one spouse is meant to help sanctify the other, and the offspring are seen not just as means to populate the earth, but literally to take the thrones that are present for us in heaven. By raising marriage to the level of a sacrament, our Lord in many senses transformed it into a different reality. In other words, like the water at Cana that he transformed into wine, he has transformed marriage into a sacrament. As a final note, Christ also came to the wedding feast of Cana to present himself as the ultimate bridegroom of all to his bride, Holy Mother Church. That's the ultimate marriage, the marriage that will be present in heaven. He has come to fulfill the prophecy of which Hosea spoke in his prophecy. As a bridegroom rejoices in his bride, the scriptures say, so shall your God rejoice in you, unquote. You see, the ultimate marriage is between God and man, and it's seen in Christ. The ultimate marriage is between God and man because he is both God and man. He is the marriage of God and man. The nuptials of divinity and humanity are found in Christ. The wedding of heaven and earth are found in Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.